Hi, I'm here to read chapter 15 of Detectives and Toga. This chapter is called Xantippus Finds the Point. You, the boys exclaimed. Yes, Caius said. I copied his handwriting. The boys clustered around him in excitement. What made you do it? Musius demanded. I wanted to get even. Then you were the one who broke into Xantippus's house? Flavius cried. Caius nodded. What did you hit him on the head with? Antonius wanted to know. With my fist, Caius said. Did you also denounce Rufus to the prefect? Musius asked with terrible sternness. No, that wasn't me, Caius said. I only wanted him to get a licking. I never thought he would be sent to prison. At this point, Publius pushed forward and asked suspiciously, how were you able to fake Rufus's handwriting so well? Caius hesitated for just a moment, then growled unwillingly. I filled in the grooves in the wax with red paint and pressed the tab against the temple wall. Publius was taken aback. That's pretty slick, he admitted. The others were equally astonished. They would have never thought of such a simple trick. Only Julius sat pondering, a frown on his face. Caius isn't as dumb as we always thought, Publius said. He even fooled Scribonus. He's lying, Julius said suddenly in a loud and decisive voice. I am not, Caius said uncertainly. You are so lying, Julius retorted. You didn't copy Rufus's handwriting at all. If you had filled the grooves in the wax with red paint and pressed the wax tablet against the wall like you said, the writing would have come out turned around. I can prove it to you. Look at this. He told the others and went to the table. Taking a piece of charcoal with which Flavius had written the letter to the emperor, he crumpled it, spat vigorously into the bit several times, and pressed his fingers kneaded and with his fingers kneaded the mass into a black pulp. Then he rushed to the corner and came back with a smooth piece of board. Sticking his fourth finger into the chalk paste, he wrote the word Caius on the board. Then he pressed the board firmly upon the white marble top, lifted it up, and triumphantly told, showed them the result. The, on the marble top, he could see distinctly, though rather smearily, the word Caius. Musius turned around, studied Caius with great seriousness. Will you explain, please, why you said you did it when you didn't? He asked sternly. And here, I'll just show you on the page right there. You can see, oh, actually on your screen, it's going the right way. But in the book, it's actually backwards where it says Caius. Caius stood with compressed lips, but abruptly he turned red and said, take me to the prefect and tell him I did it. Then Rufus will be released. Caius, uh, oh, ho, oh, so that's the way the wind blows, Publius cried scornfully. I suppose you're sorry now that you tattled to your father about Rufus, Musius said. Caius nodded. It's my fault he's in prison, he muttered guiltily. Well, it's decent of you to admit it, Julius observed with more friendliness. Let's be nice to him again, Flavius said. He's sorry about it all. I'm not sorry about anything, Caius mumbled crossly. I want to be taken back into the gang again. That's all. We haven't any time to be playing, Musius said. We have to find out who copied Rufus's handwriting. Otherwise, Rufus is done for. I know, Caius murmured with downcast eyes. I heard the whole thing. The reason I hid was because I didn't, or I wanted you to know what you fellows were saying about me. How do you know that somebody faked the handwriting? That's just what we can't prove, Musius said. Nobody will believe us. People will believe Scribonus. Maybe there's some trick to it, Caius said, scratching himself behind the ear. He looked or he looked anything but bright as he did so. Or magic, Antonius suggested. At the word trick, Julius had looked up and fixed his eyes on Caius with a cunning expression. How did you happen to think up that story of, of the paint and the grooves in the wax, he asked. Did you hit, hit it on the hit on that all by yourself? I watched the way our cook baked cookies, Caius replied. The cookies were all shaped like letters. That was a long time ago, but it made a big impression on me. He had wooden molds which were shaped like letters. He placed the molds onto a bronze platter. Then he poured the dough into the grooves of the letter and put the platter in the oven. When he took the platter out later and lifted up the molds, 
There were the baked letters on the platter. He gave them to me so I could learn to read, but I ate them. Heavenly gods, help me, Jesus, Julius murmured, overwhelmed. I bet I have it. Have what? Of course. That's the way it was done. No other way possible, Julius moaned. He's gone out of his mind, Flavia said. An evil spirit has gotten into him, Antonius said. Let him talk, Musius shouted at them. I know how Rufus' writing was copied, Julius said. Someone pierced through the letters in, on his wax tablet, then pressed the tablet against the wall and ran a brush dipped in red paint over the grooves. That way, Caius as a dumbbell would appear on the wall just the way Rufus wrote it. It took a while for the others to grasp what he meant, but then they all cheered loudly. Julius had solved the mystery. Flavius and Antonio danced with joy. With joy, Musius pounded Julius on the back. You're a genius, he praised him. Caius alone had not understood a word of the explanation, but no one had expected him to. Even though, even Publius had nothing to criticize at this time. I had a hunch it was something of the sort, he said with a grin. Let's have that letter, Musius said. We must add this explanation. Rufus will certainly be free today. Flavius had to sit down at the table, and Julius and Musius began dictating the postscript about the forging of the script. But before Flavius could finish his last sentence, they heard a well-known voice at the entrance saying, So I finally caught up with you scoundrels, and in ho hobbled Xantippus leaning on a stick. The boys gaped. Xantippus himself in person? What could have made him seek them out in their cave? Certainly nothing pleasant. And sure enough, Xantippus was anything but a sweet temper. If Rhombus hadn't told me you might be in your cave, I would have never found you, he scolded. Lovely tales I've been hearing. Groaning, he limped toward them, paused, and looked around for a seat. Musius hastily took a box and offered it to their teacher. Xantippus cautiously settled down on the box and glanced around with a frown of disapproval, for the cave was not exactly the model of neatness. Then he went on. Rufus's mother and Rompus came to see me. They had an idea you might be at school, but of course you weren't to be found. Livia told me this whole story about this whole mess with Rufus, the terrible thing. Terrible. There isn't much I can do since I'm not a Roman citizen, but I assured her of my support. My leg still hurts like the devil, but I went looking for you. And here's a picture of them in the cave. I had to rent a sedan chair with two bearers. They're waiting for me outside, and every minute is costing me money, so hurry up. What did Luco say? The boys remained shamefacedly silent. Finally, Julius murmured. For some reason, Lucas wouldn't use his second sight for us, but we found out for ourselves that Rufus is innocent, Musius declared proudly. So you have, have you, Xantippus said. You might have taken the trouble to let Livia know, leaving that poor woman in suspense all the time. Is that nice? We wrote a letter to the emperor first, Julius said. Xantippus raised his bushy eyebrows. You wrote a letter to the emperor? We wanted to show that Rufus is completely innocent and ask for a pardon for him, Musius said. Where's this fine letter of yours? Here, Musius handed their, letter, their teacher the book on which Flavius had written the letter. Xantippus moved closer to the light, unrolled the parchment, and began to read. How long, O oh Catiline, will you continue to abuse our patience? How long will you continue to mock us with your madness? Will your unbridled impudence never cease? He broke off, stared mystified at his pupils, and asked, What is the meaning of this? Why did you drag in Cicero's oration? That happens to be a copy of Cicero, Musius, Musius said. Our letter's on the back. You might have told me that in the first place, Santipus growled irritably. He turned the roll over and silently read the letter. Then he looked up and asked darkly, Who wrote this? I did, Flavius admitted. A frightful piece of words. Work, Xantippus snarled, swarming with mistakes. Your spelling is disgraceful. I'll see about this when school begins again. He tossed the parchment roll on the table. Furthermore, your logic is full of holes and your proofs are worthless, he continued. I am not surprised that you are all so bad in mathematics. Sit down. The boys obediently took seats on the boxes. No place was left for Flavius and he had to sit on the floor. Does any of you have the faintest recollection? Recollection of Pythagoras, Santipus asked. 
The boys nodded eagerly, although they no longer remembered what Pythagoras was all about. In a right angle triangle, the square of the hypotenuse equals the sum of the squares of the two sides. What do we call such a statement? Xantippus asked. A riddle? Caius mumbled. Xantippus gave him a withering look and then turned contemptuously away and called, Julius, a proof, Julius replied. Wrong, Xantippus said. It's a hypothesis. A hypothesis is a statement which must be proved before it is accepted as true. The so-called proofs in your letter are nothing more than hypothesis. Did anyone see Rufus in the baths of Diana? No, Musius admitted. Then you have no witnesses, and without witnesses you can prove nothing. Now, about the forging of the script, is it possible that Rufus, Rufus's writing tablet was used as a pattern? But who is to say that Rufus himself did not do it? Julius raised his hand. Yes, Antipas said. Why should Rufus go to all the trouble of piercing through the wax when all he had to do was write on the wall? Have you ever tried, to write, tried writing in the dark, Xantippus asked. Julius had not thought of that. You see, Xantippus said complacently, you don't even write well by light. The other boys laughed. Julius wasn't, looked insulted. Quiet, Xantippus commanded. I am not here to amuse you. Then who do you think, or do you, then do you think that Rufus is guilty, Musius asked timidly. Xantippus suddenly flew into a rage. The veins stood out on his temple. Did I say that, he barked. No, Musius stammered. Then don't ask such silly questions. Xantippus stared down at the tabletop, pondering, and the boys did not dare to stir. They were waiting for more hard words and sarcastic questions. Livia should have known better than to get Xantippus into this. He could hardly believe, or he couldn't believe that anything they did was any good. All he could do was interfere. When Xantippus looked up again, however, he seemed to be somewhat in a milder mood. I know Rufus isn't the kind of boy who goes around defacing temples, he said. We'll save him yet. The boy's spirits rose. Xantippus was capable of human emotion after all. Delighted, Musius cried out, We've been racking our brains trying to think of who really did it. Xantippus said pedantically, You have no doubt overlooked the very point that may give us a lead. Musius, tell me once more and very carefully all that you have learned so far about the whole affair in regard to Rufus. I want every little point. Even something that seems unimportant may give us a clue. Musius stood up as if he were in class, took a deep breath, and began to somewhat clumsily tell the story. But as he went on, he gained assurance. He gave a blow-by-blow -blow description of everything that had happened since the fateful quarrel between Rufus and Caius what he had done and what the boys had done, what they had discovered, what conclusions they had drawn. Now, for the first time, he saw some use in all this drill that Xantippus had given them in the art of public speaking. When he had finished, Xantippus nodded in, in approval. Take your seat, he said. Musius sat down. Xantippus reflected for a while. Then he pounded his stick twice against the rocky floor of the cave and said, We have a point to stand on. The boys stared at him in suspense. Our point is the newspaper report, Xantippus went on. What occurred to you when you read the report about the defacing of the temple? Nothing, Julius confessed. We were angry, Flavius said. On the contrary, you should have been pleased, Xantippus declared. The newspaper report proves to us that Rufus is not guilty, that in fact he is completely innocent. Why, the boys chorused because the newspaper report was written before the defacing of the temple was committed, Xantippus said. Do you understand? The boys did not. Then I shall have to explain this simple matter to you, Xantippus sighed. The censor's office, which publishes, publishes the newspaper, does not open until the third hour of the day. The first ta task of the officials is to post the morning newspaper in the forum, but the reports for the newspaper are written the night before. You see, they are written in script, and that requires much time and trouble. If the officials only began in the morning, it would be very late before the first edition of the newspaper appeared. Therefore, one copyist and one official to receive the reports always remain in the office at night until the fourth hour or at latest the fifth hour in order to gather material and write the stories. I myself worked in the censor's office for several years, so I know exactly what the procedure is. Sometimes the couriers, with especially important news items, arrive late at night. The items 
are published the next day. Now the item about the defacing the temple appeared in the first morning edition. That means it must have been delivered at the censor's office by the fourth hour of the night at the latest. I hope all this is penetrating your thick skull so I won't have to repeat it 10 times. The boys nodded assent. They were gradually beginning to realize how the newspaper report fitted into the mystery, although they still did not see how it would help them track down the real culprit. According to the testimony the, of the two police op, policemen, Xantippus continued, there was nothing on that temple wall before the fifth hour of the night. Accordingly, the newspaper report was written before the defacing of the temple, and that should give us something to think about. Couldn't this have been an exception and the item added to the bulletin in the morning, Julius asked? Such exceptions do occur when there's news of really unusual importance, which this was not, Xantippus stated, but we have an even clearer evidence that no such exception was made for this particular item. Musius said that the report was about in the middle of the newspaper among many other reports. Is that right? Yes, the boys chorus. That proves that it could not have been added in the morning or it would have been placed on an extra board. Besides which, the item was used unusually long. Most news items are published in very brief form, especially the extras. The officials, therefore, must have taken the time to write it out in full. The length of the report, moreover, suggests that it was sent by a very important personage so that, that, so that the officials did dare not shorten it. Xantippus stood up and began hobbling back and forth, leaning on his stick. We therefore have to consider the following points, he considered. How did this important personage know that Caius is a dumbbell was going to be written on the temple wall? What was his interest in seeing that the incident was reported in the newspaper? Why was suspicion so obviously pointed toward the pupils of Xantho's school? And finally, who is this personage? This last question is the first matter we have to discover. That ought not be too difficult. For example, if we know which courier delivered the report at the censor's office, we can find out who sent him. I am unfortunately out of commission. My leg hurts and I must go back home and lie down. You boys will have to find out which courier it was. Go to the censor's office and ask to speak to the official who receives the night reports. Ask him which courier brought the item about the defacing of the temple. Then come to me at once and we will see what our next step is. But kindly hurry up this time and don't waste your time on idle talk and silly letter writing. Good luck. He hobbled off toward the exit. What will we do if the report was delivered by a, an unknown courier? Julius called after him. Xantippus turned around. No official would accept a report from an unknown courier. The couriers must carry credentials with them. Any official who publishes a false story can be punished by death. And now, don't ask so many questions. Get to work. Xantippus appeared through the curtain, and the boys hurried after him. Outside the bearers, two powerful, two powerful Arabs were waiting with their sedan chair. Xantippus climbed in and ordered them to carry him back to the broad street. The bears energetically shouldered the chair and started off at a trot along the narrow path. Xantippus thrust his head out once more and called to the boys, you had better clean up your cave. It's a regular pigsty. Then dis disappeared around, around the turn. We didn't invite him, Publius remarked. Did you understand everything he said, Caius asked? I shudder to think of what we'll be in for when school starts again, Flavius said, sighing. If you ask me, Xantippus has been pretty decent, Julius commented. He's really trying to be of help. I guess he's sorry he treated Rufus so badly, Flavius said. He's really smart, Julius said appreciatively. We never would have thought about that newspaper business. The important personage must be a whopping big crook, Antonius said. Are we really going to the censor's office? Flavius asked worriedly. Of course, Musius said, and right away. Let's go. Follow me. He started off taking great leaps down the steep slope. And that's the end of chapter 15. And chapter 16 is cheap soap, burned oil, and onions. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.